Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. And I'm Mary Matte. And hey, everybody. Reminder go to go to usefulidiotspodcast.com to support the show and get bonus content. And another depressing episode this week, Katie. Yeah, of course. The war, uh, the attack on Gaza, the ethnic cleansing and genocide of Gazans uh, continues. Yes. And so this week we'll be hearing from a whole bevy of U.S. politicians and pundits saying the darndest things to try to whitewash their government's policy of supporting Israel's attack on Gaza and not calling for a ceasefire, despite the unspeakable violence that's being committed. I mean, again, not to sound like a broken record, but one million children are in Gaza, although who knows what the number will be by the end of this and when that will be. But one million children are not Hamas. Yeah, no, it looks like Hamas is hiding in tunnels while the civilian population is being pummeled. Right. Yet, as we're recording this, the Biden administration is not pushing for a ceasefire and encouraging Israel to continue. And yeah. it's just it's hard to fathom what is going to come next on top of all the horrors we've already seen. But that's what we're here to cover. So let's and get to it. And when we're recording, Biden, of course, is in Israel. And we're going to break all that down on this week's Thursday Throwdown. Yeah, and make sure that if you don't already uh, subscribe, make sure you do, because we have some really amazing, insane clips for, for Thursday Throwdown, uh, your midweek dose of media madness that uh, are, hopefully we can laugh at them instead of cry or maybe laugh and cry. All right, let's get to our four basic food groups. I have Democrats suck and... We're going to turn to this ongoing debacle in the House where, as we're recording this, Republicans are still trying to find a House speaker after the ouster of Kevin McCarthy. And the Democrats are, are enjoying this spectacle, although as long as it goes on, the House is not able to go about its business, including passing billions of dollars in funding to arm Israel and also Ukraine. But one of the arguments the Democrats are making against Republicans, and this is really a like both parties do this, is that the other party is not strong enough, is not tough enough in pursuing foreign wars. And so here is Democratic Congress member Pete Aguilar uh, making the case against Republican Speaker nominee Jim Jordan with the usual line that Jordan is weak in the face of our enemies. When our ally in Ukraine looked to Congress for additional support to help defeat Putin, he said no. And just before Hamas... Look how distracted and bored Hakeem Jeffries looks, by the way. Unrelated, but worth noting. Hakeem Jeffries said no to paying attention to this speech. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. I wonder what he's thinking about. Terrorist attack on Israel. He said no to fully funding military aid for our ally. The world is watching, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Our allies in Ukraine and Israel are watching and waiting. So let's... So let's have this vote, but let's be clear. A vote for the gentleman from Ohio is a vote to turn your back on national security. Taking up an up or down vote on help so Israel can defeat Hamas and Ukraine can defeat Putin and reassuring the American people that their legislators have their backs. All right. So he says that a vote for Jim Jordan is a vote to turn your back on national security and national security, as we know, is really just a code word for U.S. hegemony and war. So I don't know. That sounds great to me. I wish it were true. Unfortunately, it's not. Jim Jordan, I'm sure, will push through all of these uh, pro-war bills that Democrats want. But it's just so funny. And and Republicans do this, too, that the way to go after your opponent now in U.S. politics is to accuse them of being, like, you know, not sufficiently hawkish, not enough of a warmonger. And, of course, the Republicans are doing the same thing to Biden. They're saying that Biden's weakness – in the Middle East is what's responsible for all this. Not Biden sitting by as Israel continues to occupy the Palestinians. Anyway, it's nice to see that for all their disagreements, both parties can come together to accuse the other of being not enough of a warmonger. Right. Not sufficiently hawkish. Not having enough blood on their hands. Yes. It's a blood off. Well, for Republican suck, let's hear from Floridian Republican Rick Scott, former governor, current senator. Uh, let's hear what he has to say to Maria Bartiromo, who is a quite a uh, loaded and leading question for the senator. 
Well, President Biden is talking about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza as his priority. He writes this on X. We must By the way, I don't know why she's saying it's his priority. He said explicitly that he went to Israel to be in solidarity with the people of Israel. That's his priority. And let's rewind because do I detect Rick Scott shaking his head as she claims falsely oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. that Biden is prioritizing the humanitarian crisis? Let's rewind that a little bit. President Biden is talking about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza as his priority. He writes this on X. We must not lose sight of the. No, they're openly lamenting. And again, he's not prioritizing this. He's mentioning this, Biden. He said to Israel that he's going to stand by them forever, which is what you say to a country that's bombing indiscriminately when you don't want them to stop bombing indiscriminately. You say you'll stand with them forever. So this idea that he's prioritizing it is totally false. At the most, he's mentioning it. He's paying lip service to it not doing anything policy wise certainly not calling for a ceasefire in fact as we, as we as we've mentioned before he said earlier on that when he spoke to netanyahu uh he told him that if we had been uh experienced something comparable we in the united states our reaction would be swift uh and overwhelming which is again not something that you say when you're trying to urge any restraint whatsoever if only Biden could be there to correct them and say, no, I'm only paying lip service exactly. to the humanitarian crisis. And then Rick Scott's robot head could go from like shaking back and forth to nodding, be like, yeah, okay, exactly. lip service. Yes, fine. And 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 so just to, to let me quote what Biden is saying. Uh, I've come to Israel with a simple message, okay? This is the guy who Rick Scott, uh, who Maria Bertromo is accusing of prioritizing humanitarian aid. I've come to Israel with a simple message. You are not alone. As long as the United States stands and we will stand forever, you will not be alone. Okay, let's go back to the clip. That the overwhelming majority of Palestinians had nothing to do with Hamas's appalling attacks and are suffering as a result of them. Uh, this ABC Ipsos poll finds 54% of adults say that the U.S. does not bear responsibility in protecting Palestinian civilian senator. I'm actually impressed that 46 percent, I guess, of um, uh, Americans think that the U.S. does have responsibility to protect Palestinians. Given how viciously anti-Palestinian our media is, it's kind of a shock that any Americans think that it is our responsibility to protect Palestinians, Palestinian civilians. I mean, at the same time, it's disgusting because everyone should think that we should protect them. But I guess I'm, I, my mind is blown that so many people do, given how biased the reporting is. I think that's a pathetically low bar. Now, I will say this poll is of 518 people. So can we really say that 518 people represent no. the opinion of the country? It's, it's amazing to me, like the, the low bar we set for these polls, like right. these 500 individuals who represent, they represent all Americans. Yeah, a country of tens of millions of people. Yes. These are the exact microcosms of American society. Anyway, but yeah. uh, but you're right. Listen, like, given the level of propaganda that's used to manufacture consent for the Israeli state line, uh, that is a surprising number of people who actually yeah. care about Palestinian life. Yeah. But of course, she's trying to say that majority of Americans don't care. So why the hell is Biden even mentioning sure. uh, this? Okay. I haven't heard what he said about Israeli citizens. Really? Uh, but of course, they're, of course, uh, hoping and praying for for their lives after this attack from Hamas. But he's talking about the humanitarian crisis among Palestinians, Senator. So wait, it's not enough for him to say that he's in Israel to be in solidarity with Israel, that Israel is not alone. That's not talking about Israeli civilians. It's not enough to say that uh, Hamas is unadulterated evil. It's not enough to lie and say you saw photos of beheaded babies that you didn't actually see. The only thing you can say in her defense is that it is hard to understand what Biden's saying. True. So yeah. maybe when he was droning off or nodding off, she didn't yeah. quite understand. But she, yes, yeah. of course, if you pay attention to what he's saying, he's overwhelmingly talking about Israel. He's talking about his highest priorities of releasing the hostages right. held by Hamas. He's not talking about helping the people of Gaza at all because he's encouraging the attacks on them. 
How about, how about the, uh, th over a thousand people killed in Israel? How about the 30 Americans? How about the people held hostages? That's what we ought to be focused on. Look, anybody that dies in, in Gaza is a responsibility of Hamas. Uh, Hamas caused this. They're the ones who attacked the citizens uh, in Israel. They're the ones that are using civilians as a shield. They're the ones that provide. By the way, there is no proof that they use human shields. In fact, I had Norman Finkelstein on the other day and say what you will about him. The guy has read human rights reports. Uh, he kind of is embarrassed by how much time he spent doing that, if we're being honest. And there is no evidence, according to Amnesty International, from their uh, reports on Operation Cast Lead, there was no evidence of Hamas using human shields. And Israel was, of course, using that as a talking point. But there is a lot of evidence of Israel, of Israel using Palestinian human shields. Preventing civilians from getting to the uh, uh, to border with Egypt. Egypt is the one that's preventing them from crossing the border. Hamas is responsible for whatever happens in Gaza, not uh, not what Israel has to do. I mean, what they don't have a choice. They have to go in and completely annihilate Hamas. No different than we had to annihilate ISIS if we want to make sure we don't have another terrorist attack. So what he's doing there is giving Israel a total green light to do whatever it wants, to not respect any international human rights law, to actually go ahead and commit war crimes. Because no matter what happens, according to Rick Scott, it's all Hamas's fault. There's literally nothing that Israel could do that would be problematic because all the blood would be on Hamas's hands, according to Rick Scott. Yeah, and the problem here is like, this is Biden's stance too, that right. Israel is a green light. And anything bad that happens is Hamas's fault. But the problem is Republicans, they have to pretend as if it's not Biden's fault. Right. So they have to like be badgering Biden into a policy that he's in fact himself supporting. So this is the state right now of our politics. It's Republicans pretending that Biden doesn't share their exact same stance in supporting the ongoing Israeli assault on Gaza and blaming Hamas for any any atrocities that result. Right. One party, the Republicans explicitly reject talking about Palestinian civilians and explicitly blame Hamas for whatever happens to uh, Palestinian civilians. And the other party pays some lip service, but doesn't do anything. Yes. Yeah. And right. that that is American democracy. OK, for isn't that weird? Isn't that terrible? We're going to shift away from Israel, Palestine and turn to some lighthearted fare. And here is a story for Isn't That Weird about a man in New Zealand setting a record for bungee jumping. He jumped with a bungee cord 941 times in one day. And there's video. It was crying. I had water leaking out of my eyes. Do you feel dizzy at the end of all this? What does it do to you physically? Uh, some people do experience dizziness, yes. Um, Luckily, I've never been one to have that. From time to time, you get sort of like a seasickness or, or motion sickness feeling, but um, I just sort of pushed through that and, um, and, and got on with it. So it didn't slow us down or affect us at we all. Well, I guess congratulations are in order. I mean, that is an achievement. Um, that's a lot of times to bungee jump, 941 times in one day. Why someone would be compelled to do that is a different story. But I guess, right. I don't know, maybe it's like a New Zealand thing. Um, Maybe New Zealanders are really in a bungee jumping. In bungee jumping, yeah. We'd have yeah. to go do a deep dive and figure out who the last winner was. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, he originally set the record for the most bungee jumps in 24 hours with a 16 to 32 foot cord in 2017 with 430 jumps, but his record was broken in 2022 by Francois Marie Dibon, who completed 765 jumps. So then he re won the crown, recaptured the record. And completed 941. Okay. And I think everyone can be satisfied with their role in this. The person who did it over 700 times, that's nothing to sneeze at. Nothing to sneeze at, yeah. And I don't know if we need more bungee jumping right now. Like, I don't know if we need to keep this battle going. I mean, like, I could just see, like, how long could this go on for? I know, until, right. A thousand? Yeah, a thousand or two thousand. I mean, who knows? Although it's kind of an easy record to break, it seems like. Well, no, at a certain point, it won't be easy because you have to do it within 24 hours. Yeah. So if you do like at a certain point, there are too many. Out, uh, it would become physically impossible at a certain point. But uh, yeah, he, he did it to raise awareness for mental health, at least. Oh, really? Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, there we go. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's, and, I mean, it's almost like, isn't that heartwarming? Yeah. yeah I, I, I tip my, I mean, what a sacrifice to make to raise awareness about mental health is to bungee jump 941 times. That's, yeah. All right. I'm impressed. I take it back. Good for him. That's an, isn't that inspiring? We've got a problem in this country and I want to help expose that and get Kiwis talking. I want my kids to grow up with a positive state of mental health and it's a great platform and opportunity to do that. Sorry. I don't have a good New Zealand accent, but well, I'm uh, humbled. I'm humbled because your accent is fantastic, and I'm humbled by his commitment to mental yeah. health. So good for him. The only problem is, I, I I hope he doesn't have mental health problems just from the physical trauma to his brain of jumping. Well, Katie, I'm sure if that's true, you will then raise awareness for him by, by, jump, by, yeah, by, by breaking his jumping. record. By yeah, breaking his record times. next year. Exactly. Yes. Right. Yeah. All right. What do we have for? Isn't that terrible? So for Isn't That Terrible, we have a very creepy story uh, about uh, a boy who is scaring his neighbors by wearing a very scary Megan Halloween costume. And it's not even Halloween next. So let's go to the article and the videotape. Boy terrifies neighbors by crawling around in scarily real Megan Halloween costume. Tyson was filmed by his mom, Maya Cooper, who says he scared his neighbors while dressed as the AI doll from the 2022 horror film, Megan. So uh, let's, let's watch the videotape. He's been scaring a dog. It looks like we're going to see his, uh, Sign that that's the signature Megan move apparently that dance <laughs> pretty terrible scary stuff not even a Halloween yet that's what makes it pretty unforgivable <laughs> if it was Halloween you'd have some context you'd be on the lookout for people in costumes you see it now you think you may actually think that's Megan mm. well I haven't seen this movie or actually even heard of it but uh I also have to salute any dedication to a costume even if it's not Halloween and I think this young boy pulled it off pretty well. Yeah, he's committed to the bit, I guess. Yeah. And that, those have been your four basic food groups. We are really uh, excited to be talking to Miko Peled. Miko Peled is an author, activist, Israeli American peace activist. He's the author of the book, The General Son an Israeli's journey in Palestine, as well as the book Injustice, the story of the Holy Land, Foundation Five. And Miko comes from a really fascinating background. His father was a very high ranking general in the Israeli army. His maternal grandfather was one of the signatories to Israeli independence. Uh, his father became an advocate of the two state solution, met with Yasser Arafat. And then tragically, Miko's niece was killed in a suicide bombing. And this really politicized Miko and made him an advocate of the one state solution. So he has a really interesting perspective on all of this. And he now lives in the United States, but he was raised in Israel and uh, spends a lot of time in both places. All right, let's go to the co -pilot. Miko, welcome back. Thank you, good to be with you again. So you have friends and family in Israel, and you have friends in uh, Palestine. I, those are problematic terms in themselves. But what are people telling you on the ground? Well, my Israeli family and friends don't talk to me anymore. So there's, I'm not really getting much from them. They don't like my stance. And so that, that kind of is on hold right now. Palestinians, depends where they're from. I mean, the messages out of Gaza are, of course, you know, desperate. Absolutely de more desperate than... than than they've ever been, and they've been very desperate in the past. This is not the first, you know, savage bombing that they have, that they have to endure. But the, everybody's saying this is far worse than, than anything they've seen. In the West Bank, you know, Palestinians are being arrested. They're being harassed by soldiers and settlers. Inside 1948, Palestinians are afraid to open their mouth and leave their homes and uh, go to work and send their kids to school. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. Palestinians... Citizens of Israel who are, you know, going to university on campus, there are videos of, you know, being yelled at and screamed at, go to Janin, go to Gaza, you know, what the hell are you doing here, women in hijab. So it's it's more, I don't know what, what you used to, word to use. I mean, it's more intense and more brutal and cruel than, um, 
than I think it's uh, uh, Palestinians have ever experienced. I think this is probably this may well be worse than 1948. So why, without trying too much, why is your family not talking to you? What what are the, what's the difference in your stances or your your interpretations of what's happening? Well, I think the, well, uh, from what for what I was told, which isn't much, uh, the fact that I referred to the rumors as rumors, like the beheadings of the babies, stuff like that. Yeah, and how dare I? Because you know all these poor, all these Israelis have been killed, and I'm not showing the kind of uh, empathy I should be showing to. And we and, I, and I, you and I talked about this. I have family in Kibbutz Beri, which was hit very hard. But my point is that these are rumors still, and it's going to be a while before we find out exactly what these Palestinian fighters did or didn't do. And as you know very well, there's testimony by Israelis who were at the kibbutz that many of the casualties among the, the, the Israelis who were held by the Palestinian fighters uh, were caused by Israeli fire, by shelling, you know, tanks shelling these buildings, these homes, small homes where Israelis were being held. So we don't know exactly what happened, and, and I don't I don't want to accept the rumors. I think these rumors, these rumors are being thrown at the very fertile racist ground, and when you and the racism is inside you, sometimes you don't even know. I mean, a lot of Israelis don't wouldn't think that they're racist, but when the racism exists, then and these rumors are you know sewn into this you know very fertile racist ground that they make sense, and only once you kind of you know somehow surgically remove the racism, you have a better idea of what may or may not have happened and, and the ability to wait and see. And, and, and the other thing is, while we don't know exactly what happened, and these are rumors, and many of them have been refuted, we do know what Israel is doing. We do know that Palestinian babies are being, are being burnt and, and beheaded and, and, and destroyed when these one-ton bombs or half-ton bombs are, are dropped on buildings. So they show these, you know, the images all the time of buildings collapsing. But if there are children in those buildings, are they not, you know, what do you think happens to their bodies? So without getting into all these gory details, these rumors and the conversations are pulling us in one way where I think we should be pulled in the other direction. And then for people, you know, for Israelis, this is hurtful. They, they think the whole world uh, should stand by them and to, should stand with um, in complete sympathy with them and screw the Palestinians, I suppose. I don't know. I don't want to use complicated, but it's more uh, difficult than it's uh, in terms of the tension than, than I've ever seen it. What do you What do you mean by that? I mean the 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 the, the perspectives. You know, I mean, uh, if you take me and my family for example, my perspective has always been you know f far different from theirs. But we managed to maintain some kind of a, you know kind of a status quo, compartmentalize the differences and and and. Um, and keep the family going and, 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 and the family relations going. And from time to time, you know, when, 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 when things are heightened, then uh, reality is more violent and there's a lot of tension. And then you either work out the tension or you don't. It's a, it's a choice. I know that from, as you um, uh, discuss in your book, um, when your niece was tragically killed in a suicide bombing, your sister, your niece's mother, uh, told Netanyahu that he was responsible. Yeah. So does she still, does she see this also as uh, Netanyahu's responsibility? I don't know. We never had a conversation. Okay. I assume, I would assume so, but I have, I have no idea. I, we never had the conversation. There does seem to be a lot of blame of Netanyahu from people who aren't anti-Zionist even. Yes, I mean, the government failed and he is the prime minister. So... But the but when you look at the Israeli papers, the, the the questions and the demands and the disappointment with the government, they're not up front. They're not the main headlines or even the secondary headlines. They're buried way, 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 way down at the bottom. And and at the end of the whatever report or whatever story it is, it's always well. But this is not the time. This is not the time to lay blame. And Netanyahu is a smart politician. What he's doing in the meantime, he's just gaining a lot of popularity. A lot of popularity with this with this savage uh, attack on Gaza, because this is what Israelis have been asking for, you know, for a very long time. This is what Israelis have been demanding, and so finally he's delivering what they want. So uh, even if they do at one point stop for a minute and look back and say, "Well, you know, it's time for some you know reckoning. It's time to investigate," he's going to be fine.
He's not going anywhere. And the government, and really the Israelis don't have an opposition, so they don't have somebody else to vote for. There's not like an, another option. In the past, there used to be two political blocks that were clearly different in most things. And so Israelis could choose, okay, we're going to choose for somebody else. Now there's nobody. I mean, it's, it's musical chairs. People go in and out of government, you know, the government, the cabinet, you know, all the time. So if somebody's not in there now, he was, they were there six months ago. And so the government is safe and Netanyahu knows how to play this game so well that he's, he's not going anywhere. Miko, do you think there's going to be an Israeli ground invasion of Gaza? I think that depends. I think it depends on whether or not the demand for the million or so people from the northern Gaza Strip, including the city of Gaza, to, to evacuate. If these demands are met and the Israeli forces feel safe, that there are no people around that can fight them, then yes, they will invade. Um, if Palestinians stay, then Israel won't, Israel won't, won't invade. Won't, there won't be a ground invasion as long as Israel feels there might be fighters on the ground because they've seen in the past that the Palestinian fighters, even with their meager resources, are far superior and can inflict serious, serious damage to the Israeli ground forces. So the only way they will put in a single boot or a single tank inside the Gaza Strip is if there's absolutely nobody there. And even then, they'd be, in my opinion, they'd be taking a huge risk because everybody knows that the Palestinian fighters exist underground in tunnels. And they'll be waiting. They'll be waiting. There's no question that they'll be waiting for the forces as they come in. It'll be there'll be a lot of bloodshed. A lot of Israeli forces will be killed. So I, I don't. So the con. So you know the 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 result of this rationale, in my opinion, is that there won't be a ground invasion. And why is Israel unwilling to negotiate? I mean, obviously, famously, uh, in 2011. Gilad Shalit, who was captured by uh, Palestinians, was uh, released in a prisoner exchange deal. And now we see that not only are there not exchanges, but as you just referred to, according to eyewitnesses, Israel is going in and has shot its own captives, uh, Israeli captives. So what explains this difference? Well, uh, the capture of Gilad Shalit was a humiliation, but it wasn't this big. So now Israel is into revenge. They want to exact as much revenge as possible. They keep, you know, the mantra, we will destroy Hamas, which of course we know is impossible, but that's the mantra. And at least the government is showing, and Netanyahu is showing his constituents that he's causing as much, as much destruction as possible. Now, why negotiate? For what? What's, what's in it for, the, for, for Israel to negotiate? Why should they negotiate? There are a lot of voices. That it's a, there's a very popular call for forsaking the hostages in order to exact the highest price from the Palestinians in Gaza and to destroy Hamas, you know, whatever that means. And so that's what he's doing. And, the, and, and I think if at the end of the day, the hostages were killed, I don't think they're going to be killed, but if they were all killed, then Israelis are going to see that as a terrible thing, but perhaps a price that had to be paid. But there's, there's really no reason to negotiate. I mean, they're, they're bombing the hell out of Gaza. They don't care that men, women, and children are being killed. We saw the Israeli president, Herzog, who comes from this line, long line of labor, moderate, you know, reasonable Zionists, saying there are no innocent civilians in the Gaza Strip. So, you know, he's basically calling for the, the this genocide of, of Palestinians. And what I think he's not realizing as well what he, that he's doing is he's giving license to kill Israelis because we know that Israelis are, every Israeli has, almost every Israeli has served or is serving in the military in some capacity. So the, so, uh, so, there's no reason to negotiate. Why should, he, why should Israel negotiate for what? And what do you say to people who say, we just need to, uh, so you have people saying that there's no civilian Gazans, right? I mean, unbelievably, as, as, as you just alluded to, the president of Israel has said that. Uh, you've had Israeli... Um, uh, defense minister saying that they were going to shut everything off, you know, not distinguishing at all between Hamas and and Gazans, calling them human animals. Uh, but then you do have some people saying, okay, Gazans aren't Hamas or Hamas are, don't represent all Gazans. We just need to get rid of Hamas. What's your response to that? Well, first of all, Palestinians have never had an army. There's never been a Palestinian military force, so how could they all? How could any Palestinian not be a civilian? It's because they have small groups of guerrilla fighters 
there's no conscription, there's no draft, there's no army. So Palestinians have never had, have, have, have always been civilians. And Israel, as we know, has been killing thousands of Palestinians, you know, not from, not in, way before October the 7th. And so how could they possibly justify killing so many civilians? They have to say, well, actually, they're not, there are no civilians. Well, they're all civilians. There is no Palestinian who's not a civilian, except for a small group of, relatively small group of guerrilla fighters. And there's no way to kill only them or find, you know, it's, 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 it's nonsense. It's complete, complete nonsense. You know, it's complete nonsense. And I, I want to say something about the negotiations too, from your previous question. I think at the end of the day, they will be, they will negotiate because there's no other way to end something like this. But, uh, it's, it's, it's nonsense. This whole discourse is, is, is grotesque. This whole discourse about uh, trying to justify the killing of all or some as the, this, the savagery continues against the people who have never had a military force, have never had any kind of army, have never had a tank, and have never done anything wrong to anyone other than being Palestinians. They are guilty of nothing. It's, 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 I can't believe people go on and on and on and on ad nauseum with, with this, with this conversation. This is not the conversation that needs to be had. The conversation that I think needs to be had is what can Palestinian gain at the, at the end of the day when negotiations begin? What should they demand? Because they've had, they've shown that they can maintain the upper hand. I mean, they're being killed, yes, but at the same time, we saw the Palestinian fighters completely disable the entire state of Israel, paralyze it, which means they can. They're, they're, there's a lot. There's a lot that they can. Um, they've got a lot of leverage when they come to negotiate. So I think that should be the conversation, and how we and how the international community can stop this carnage. How the international, what the international need, community needs to do, because people say, "Oh, the West." Well, it's not only the West. BRICS is, you know, supporting Israel. Of course, they're not as, you know, vocal, vocal as as the United States and the Brits and the Europeans. But they're there. They're buying weapons. They're at the end of the day, they're they've got uh, the diplomatic missions and so on, and they continue to do commerce and everything else. And then the Arab world and the, the Islamic world, you know, there's been the normalization may have been put on hold, but the push for normalization is still there. So that really is the conversation, how we bring this to an end for real, not a ceasefire, but a complete end to the blockade, the complete release of Palestinian uh, prisoners, uh, aid, immediate aid to Palestinians and all this with no conditions, unconditional to the point that at the end of the day, we bring to the unconditional surrender of the apartheid state that should be the main goal so the palestinians have shown what they're capable of doing a handful of, 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 of well-trained palestinian fighters like i said paralyzed an entire state so we know what they're capable of doing and israel knows very well what they're capable of doing now so how do we turn that into political gain i think it needs to be the conversation not whether or not they dropped uh, phosphorus or they didn't drop phosphorus or they did blow the hospital but you know what i mean people kind of get into this into this conversation that is meaningless as opposed to talking about the real important issue that's happening. But do you think Israel um, cares about negotiating at this point? There's already been claims that their airstrikes have killed hostages. I'm not sure if that was a, a lie by Hamas or not, but that is what was claimed. And if it's true that Palestinians show that they can you know, strike fear in Israel, um, it seems to me that Israel is just determined to wipe out the Palestinians, uh, including civilians, but no matter how many die. I, I mean, do you have any sense that at some point this will Israel will stop this and actually turn to negotiating with Hamas? They will have to. There's, they will have to. Any any end to this ends with negotiations. There's no end to any conflict without negotiations. Even if it's complete surrender of one side or the other, it comes with negotiations. And we know the Blinken was already in Qatar. That means he's talking to the Hamas leadership there. And he was in Egypt. Egypt is usually the go-between. So the negotiations are probably already going on. The fact that they're not disclosing or claiming that they're going on, they're already going on. Otherwise, Lincoln wouldn't be traveling to these countries. And, um, and Biden wouldn't be there as well if there was no negotiations going on. They're not going there for fun. The question is, again, <clears throat> how, how long will it take? And what will the terms be? And how strong... Will the Palestinian demands be how substan you know substantial they will be when they actually do negotiate? Because the Palestinians have pay are paying such a heavy price anyway, and they've shown their capabilities. So, at least in my opinion, I think they they have they have very very strong leverage. But it's, there's no way to tell when it's going to happen. Yeah, I. 
I don't share that view, unfortunately. I, I hope you're right that because if Palestinians have leverage and that could bring this to an end, but I, I see in Israel a sort of a genocidal intent or at least an ethnic cleansing intent. And I mean, it's fair to say that there's been a, it's been a long time Israeli goal to basically continue the Nakba of 1948. I mean, that's fair to say, right? Oh, of course. I mean, this is going to be, of course, you're absolutely right. This has been going on for 75 years. The ethnic cleansing and the genocidal policies have been going on for 75 years without any question. This is a continuation of that and maybe a you know hyper continuation of that at this particular point. But of course, it's always been a, a strategic objective of Israel to, to kill and displace as many Palestinians as possible. I don't think at the end of the day, it is possible. At the end of the day, even if they kill thousands more, they can't kill 100,000 people. They can't kill, you know, a million people. No, even, even the United States is not going to stand for that. And we see massive protests in the U.S. I mean, yesterday in the, in the Senate here in Washington, D.C., there were hundreds. And I mean, this is not something that they can just say, okay, fine, kill them all. That, that reality doesn't, is, is, not, is not possible. I don't see it as a possibility. Um, so they will kill many more. Yes. The, the bombing and the genocidal desire for the genocide is there politically, of course, and the popular demand in Israel is for that, of course. But I don't think that's going to continue beyond a certain point. How, what that point is, of course, is a, is a big question. But, and again, what happens once it starts? And again, I actually believe it already began. I don't think Blinken would go there for nothing. So it probably already began. The question is what are Palestinians asking for and how much they can get since they've paid such a heavy price on the one hand, there's really nothing to lose. And since they've shown their capabilities, I mean, they, they, you know, I mean, the airport wasn't pop, wasn't operating. I don't know if it's operational right now. I mean, there's panic and a lot of airlines won't fly, won't land in Tel Aviv because of the, um, the rockets, you know, for a country that has one airport, that's a big deal. The roads, nobody wanted to drive the roads. The, the stores, you know, the, the shelves in the stores were empty. Everybody's terrified. And all the systems that people relied on or they thought they can rely on collapsed. The military was not there. The military that we thought was so capable proved itself once again to be completely incapable. This intelligence uh, apparatus that everybody always praises, the Israeli intelligence, was gone. It, was dis it wasn't functioning. And I think, I mean, I was expecting this. I never thought it was as great as people said it was. It's, see, there were all the signs that were showing that the Israeli military, the Israeli intelligence were not as good as people think. And, uh, you know, they were challenged and they, they fell apart. You know, Palestinians took over 22 cities and, you know, settlements. And they, almost the entire southern part of the country was taken by, Palestine, by a handful of Palestinian fighters who came in by gliders. I mean, think about this for a minute. So, and again, how this translates, I think, is the big, is the big question. And what happens between now and then? We can be certain that Palestinians are going to continue to pay a heavy price and the world is, you know, silent. And how much um, of the failure to be prepared for what happened has to do with soldiers being uh, busy defending and collaborating with settlers? Protecting, I should say, not defending, protecting. And The large portion of the Israeli military capability is reservists. You know, the regular army is, 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 is not big enough to deal with more than one issue at a time. I mean, the reservists are the main thing. But it took what? It took, it took a day, two days before they started calling reservists. And then when the reservists showed up, they didn't have the, 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 the entire logistic operation, you know, it was, was collapsed. There was, there was nothing there. They take, it took them forever before they, they need to be armed. They need to get, you know, uniforms. They need to be put in trucks. They need to be sent to the front when nobody knew where the front was. So reservists just took a gun wherever they could find one, put on a uniform that they had in the closet and ran down to, to participate in the fighting. You know, that's, that's, not, that's not a defense system. That's not something Israelis can rely on or any, any nation can rely on. You know, this kind of partisan, or partisan uh, you know, warfare. And uh, it, it was incredible to see the, how, how well planned and disciplined and orderly and organized the Palestinian fighters were and the complete chaos of this oversized, you know, overfed, overfinanced uh, military force, which is the Israeli army, and how, how clumsy they are, and how clumsy they were. And then when they came, because they came with so much firepower, they killed their own people. There is a tweet uh, that shows uh, clashes at the abductees' headquarters, a demonstration near Kiryan Tel Aviv after one 
of the yes. passerbys calls the father of an abductee a traitor. Can you uh, set up what's happening here and then we'll watch the clip? Well, the, the families of the people who are abducted want their children back. They want the ceasefire and they want the, an exchange of prisoners. You know, if you have a son or a daughter or a family member that's been abducted, you know, the hell with this nonsense. You release the, the Palestinian prisoners and I want my child back. Um, and like I said earlier, there's a very strong call to, you know, just, just to forsake the, the, um, all of them and just keep blowing the hell out of Gaza, even if it means killing them. I don't think the Palestinians will kill them, but the Israeli fire might. And so, um, they're protesting and they're demanding, you know, and, uh, I guess passersby, passersby came, you know, came walk across and, and started calling them traitors because they are standing in the way of wiping out all of, uh, all of Gaza and everybody that's in it. So that's, that's what I think you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to tell who's who over there in that in that clip, but uh, they're calling to lynch him. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a, they're calling him some very terrible names, and they say that this uh, this person should be lynched for being a traitor, for calling yeah. for the release of the for negotiations. Yeah, for negotiations and releasing the prisoners. Uh, you know, Israeli society has always been held by Scotch tape. And over the last few years or last year with all the protests, the hundreds of thousands that were out there, which were the most privileged among Israeli society, this was the, you know, the, the top uh, the top level of, of, the, of the totem pole, if you will, of the socioeconomic ladder. We could see that it's a society that's, that's really, the, the Scotch tape is, is falling apart. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. And that was Nico Pellet. He is author of the book, The General's Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine, uh, drawing on his experience of coming from the heart of Israel's elite. His father was a Israeli general uh, who served in the military, Miko did, but has gone on to become a, a peace activist, calling for yeah. equality between Israelis and Palestinians. And in addition to The General's Son, which is an amazing read, and I highly recommend it, and I, I actually read it and then I listened to it on Audible, uh, which he himself reads. He's also the author of uh, Injustice, the Story of the Holy Land Foundation Five. And just as a little teaser, he does kind of tell us in the um, in the extended interview, he comes up with the solution to all of this. I'm not sure if Aaron's on board, but he does have an idea. And for more Useful Idiots, you can go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash usefulidiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also, subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at usefulidiotpod and use the hashtag usefulidiotspod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the Useful Idiots Monday Morning Show, where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. <laughs>